All right. Good morning, Doug. We're back with viewer questions, specifically ones from members of the file. If you're interested in finding out more about our private member community, go to uh, file, P-H-Y-L-E dot C-O, file dot C-O. Um, before we get there, Doug, I got to say, in, in, uh, in celebration of John Fetterman and the reduced stress code in the Senate, I figured I'd wear my hoodie today. So I hope you like it. Well, that's 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 very good, and we'll have to discuss the uh, reduced uh, dress code in uh, the world at large, and the Senate in particular, sometime in the future, because I'm sure it'll degrade further. Uh, today is, or tomorrow is, I'm not sure which, uh, the start of fall in the northern hemisphere and uh, spring in the southern hemisphere, so worth noting, perhaps. Um, but uh, looking through... Um, Encyclopedia Britannica's note of the day, which I've gotten in the custom of doing uh, today, or was it yesterday, the 21st, uh, anyway, uh, is the day that um, that Joseph Smith uh, encountered the uh, angel Moroni. Mm. And uh, the, uh, I guess the Mormon religion was, was started. So that's that's kind of marvelous. I mean, I guess that's the equivalent of, uh, or is it, of St. Paul being struck down on the road to Damascus? With yeah, a perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. I mean, how much of you, uh, how much do you know about the LDS religion? Well, I have uh, a fair number of LDS friends. Yeah, me too. And, and we talk about aspects of their religion. And of course, as religions go, uh, LDS is not bad. I mean, uh, the kids are all well behaved and they're neat and clean. They've got, you know, good basic values. Of, you know, they're they're kind of like it, it should be a 1950s style religion from that point of view because everything is yeah. so. If you were down. to if you were to judge a religion by its fruits. Uh, you look at the Mormons and you go, the fruits of their their communities seems positive. It does. They're all very well to do. In fact, as I, I look at Mormonism, it's actually uh, the American version of Islam, which is yes. more you're not supposed to well. say that. You're not supposed to say that. You're not. I mean, I think it's factual. I mean, yeah, they're very, very similar. Everything from uh, the idea that you can. You have more than one wife, got no problem with that, whatever works for you, but uh, similar with both of them. And, no no uh, drinking, no drinking, no alcohol. Yeah. No drinking, that's right. And uh, God, there's all kinds of similarities uh, between the uh, the two uh, religions. Yeah, yeah, prophets both, yep. I guess they're both simple. I don't think the Mohammedans have to wear uh, long underwear. No, but they have other they have other dress requirements. The women have to wear hijabs if they're going to be fully observant. So mm -hmm. anyway, people people love their religions. And uh talking about religions, as long as we've been banned by YouTube, I guess we can say what we want at this point. Yeah. Is that um I'm reliably informed that uh the Jewish uh feast of Rosh Hashanah started uh last week. That's the Jewish New Year. And then uh, there, there are 10 days of high holidays. And uh, in a couple of days, or maybe it's, I'm not sure, uh, they have Yom Kippur. So mm -hmm. not being a Jew, I'm not sure what they do, but I have some Jewish friends that I'm on another uh, Zoom call with, which is, and uh, they all take this stuff very seriously. What does it mean, uh, 10, 10 days of high holiday? What does that mean? mean? High holidays. I, well, I'm not sure. I don't celebrate them. So that's like <laughs> inside baseball knowledge for me. It's just like how how we don't know exactly what those peep stones did with Joseph Smith because we're not on the inside. We don't. And, and people that are not members of the Roman Catholic faith uh, have only uh, the loosest grip on things like the Annunciation and the Assumption and you know these peculiar holidays that uh, so I, I guess they all have their, their little drills that they go through. Anyway, this is a 
we're, we're close to a big one for the Mormons and the Jews both. Um, what else? Uh, Bill Murray uh, was born today in 1950. Mm. So I'm I'm a big fan of big Bill Murray. I think he's yeah, a me great, too. Great guy, very talented. And um, another little fact tet. I don't know why I made a note of this, but in 1937, this is the day that the uh, Hobbit was published. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of Tolkien, uh, and I've got to say that the three movies that Peter Jackson made of the talk of the Lord of the Rings trilogy were works of genius uh excellent uh, presentation of what in video form what Tolkien wrote about they're almost as good as the books uh, but they screwed it up with the Hobbit uh I guess just to to rip off uh, some some money I mean it was a short book should have been one movie but they made it into two or three movies and just ruined the whole thing yeah the anyway. gravy train you know yeah, gravy time. I got to do it, right? So, um, and in today, 1931, uh, England dropped the uh, gold standard. And it was uh, uh, a couple of years after that, that Roosevelt did it for the U.S. But uh, just goes to show that you can't trust any of these governments. Uh, hmm. No. So yeah. anyway, that's a little throwaway fact. Now, here's something that's more interesting. I don't want to get into the economic weeds. Uh, Bob Ross. Have you ever watched his painting? Oh yeah, show? yeah, the, the yeah the painter, yeah, she had a guy with, yeah. with a nice little tree. Let's put a nice little tree here. <laughs> yeah. So his first painting uh, that he did on his first show, 1982 or whatever it was, uh, has just been offered in the aftermarket. And do you know what the asking price on that painting is? I have no idea. Can't even imagine. Yeah, what wild guess. I mean, the way art goes, I don't know, a million dollars? $9.8 million. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it took Bob 27 minutes to paint that. Right, he had to do it in one PBS episode. That's right. He did. So is it worth $9.8 million? Well, its uh, value is arbitrary and subjective. So there you have it. And uh, since I watch the art market, actually, I watch a number of art auction sites with all kinds of stuff. And the prices of artwork is totally, totally arbitrary and meaningless. Whether something goes for a million or 10 million or, or $10. So you mean you're saying as, as, an, as an objective observer, you look at it and you would not be able to, if you don't know anything about the market, you would not be able to judge it, which is most valuable as an objective, but studied observer. Exactly. I mean, when I look at artwork, and I look at a lot online, and I buy some sometimes, it's uh, I look for uh, ideational value and technical excellence, actual skill. And I guess Bob Ross has has some skill, uh, more than I do, certainly. But $9.8 million, what will it be worth 10 years from now, 100 years from now? I, I have no idea. But Well, it probably won't be priced in dollars that far ahead. <laughs> Uh, that's the other thing we know for sure. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's interesting remarking on. And uh, the last thing that uh, I noted from Encyclopedia Britannica is uh, everybody's probably heard of Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. But a lot of people likely think that she's a fictional character. I mean, hmm. made up. I about assume so a Nazi movie of some type dressed in black leather and engaging yeah. in orgies. But the fact of the matter is that Ilsa, who was born in uh, like 19, uh, 1913 or something like that, uh, was actually the uh, wife of the commandant of Buchenwald. And uh, all these horrible things that you hear about Ilsa, she-wolf of the SS, her name was Ilsa Koch, are true. Or, well, they're said to be true, and I think they probably are true. I mean, she's the one that that did the uh, lampshades out of skin and had all kinds of wild sex orgies. And, I mean, just a, just a 
are a totally wild and crazy person. So anyway, she's real. She was real. And uh, she was, uh, she was, she walked out free because she was only the wife and she was put in jail for a couple of years. And then everybody got so pissed off about, how can you let Ilsa go? And uh, she was put back in jail for 20 years. And you know, finally she died in 1967. So that's the thing with Ilsa. But here's a little fact that interesting side fact about Ilsa is that she was married to the commandant of Buchenwald. And um, it turns out that the SS prosecuted her husband for corruption and degraded practices and executed him in 1945, when, when the gig was almost up anyway. I mean, 1945, I mean, yeah. it was almost over. But the, the SS thought he was such a bad guy that they prosecuted him for corruption and degradation and, and theft in 1945. It's I amazing. find that really amusing. That's hilarious. It really that's is. Amazing. <laughs> so anyway, that's <clears throat> that's that's uh, some blasts from the past. Okay. All right. Well, let's get to some of these viewer questions. Uh, first one is, I heard Doug go off recently on royalty. Um, we talked about the royals, the European royals, I believe. And he said, what's your view of the book Democracy, The God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hoppe? And uh, if, if democracy is not good and monarchy, monarchy is not good, what is the answer? Yeah, I'm a fan of Hoppe, and I liked his book, uh, worth reading, uh, Democracy, The God That Failed. And basically, what uh, although he's an ANCAP, uh, he says that in the real world, as I interpret what he really believes, uh, although he's an ANCAP, uh, he says in the real world, you know, people, uh, you know, we're herd animals, pack animals, you got to have a leader and so forth. So the best way to do this is with uh, small satrapies, uh, counties and baronies and princedoms, little things like they had in Germany before Bismarck united them all. And the Germans, that's when the Germans got into trouble. So he says the ideal thing is that uh, these little princedom, principalities are, are better because the prince theoretically owns everything and as the owner of something, but with lots of others around so people can escape if he's too crazy, um, he treated it like a valued possession, different from the way that uh, the people that are elected to a democracy treat things. So that uh, makes sense. Yeah, that's reasonable. Okay. Um, so, but, but my answer is, and probably not realistic, is that if you treat the whole world like a restaurant, uh, yeah, the guy that owns the restaurant, you know, but you don't have to eat in the restaurant. And uh I've never seen a restaurant tour get out of control, even when the restaurant was owned by a mafia guy. So uh, I don't think you need or want a government, frankly. Yeah. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, this guy says he's thinking about moving to Argentina after a recent trip there. What does Doug think would happen if the country does dollarize and then the dollar crashes due to all the money, money printing in the U.S.? Well... Going to the dollar from the Argentine peso, good. it's a nice halfway house. But what they've really got to do is go to gold or maybe go to Bitcoin or, or both. I mean, give people an alternative of what they want to use as a medium of exchange and a store of value. But you certainly don't want the Argentine state or any state involved. So dollar is a halfway house and the dollar will crash. But I hope that um, Malay if he's elected before he's assassinated or God knows what happens, uh, we'll uh, try to go to gold and or Bitcoin. Hmm. Okay. Um, Doug, how do you stay rich? You know, if you work hard and maybe start a business, you get rich. How do you stay rich? Yeah, that is a, a tough problem. I mean, getting rich is hard enough, frankly, but, uh, Staying rich, especially in the days when, like to, these days, when can't 
can't hold dollars for the long term. You'll lose your money. Can't put the dollars in banks. The bank could, you know, bail in. You could be bailed into a bank. Uh, stock market, very overpriced. Bond market, there's problems everywhere. So how do you stay rich? Uh, and of course, Richard Russell, uh, who's been dead now for, I don't know, 10 years or something anyway, uh, he said, um, in a depression, uh, the winner is the person that loses the least. So maybe you won't stay quite as rich. But look at the bright side. It's that, you know, Ferrari that might be $500,000 now, <clears throat> 20 years from now, you'll be able to dig it out of a barn and once you shoo away the rats and the birds and the mice the nesting in its in it i mean opportunity for another fortune but uh guy that owned the five hundred thousand dollar ferrari took a loss so uh staying rich is hard mm. have you what, what big mistake because you've known a lot of people who were very wealthy and then for the end of their life you told me about at least a couple of them you know ended up penniless or near it what what what's the, what are the mistakes that they make that cause that to happen? Is there a pattern? I think in a lot of cases they um, they they did not differentiate luck and being in the right place at the right time from being a genius. I mean, just because the stock market went up and you were in it doesn't necessarily mean you were a genius, uh, and this is true in a lot of different areas. So, uh, you know, you have to uh, you have to be prudent, and I know a man's got to know his limitations. Mm. That's a good answer. I increasingly, I, I increasingly see the wisdom of that of that phrase. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, um, will the Japanese bond market lead to the financial chaos to come? Will that be a source of the difficulty? Any, any, any? I think Japan is unique in having zero, still maintaining zero or near zero or maybe less than zero in some cases, interest rates. And that is a potential catastrophe, a disaster. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm uh, not optimistic about the uh, fate of the yen or the Japanese bond market in particular, because interest rates approach zero bonds go as close to infinity as they can. Uh, reminds me, I think we probably talked a couple of years ago when the Austrian government uh, floated a 100-year bond at 2%. Yep. And I think we said this is completely insane. Who's buying a 100-year bond with a 2% coupon? Well, there were idiots, of course, because I think in the open market now, it's trading at around 40 or something like that. Yeah, how could it not? Yeah. It's so who are, the, like who are the fools that actually bought a 2% 100-year bond? I mean, what was... Or, or the people who bought the, those bonds for that, didn't Argentina float a 100-year bond? Yes. <laughs> yes, I think <laughs> they did. And somebody, bought, it was a 7% coupon. So these people are, it's just crazy. I mean, who who are these money managers that do these things? I, I don't know. But you know what? They, I was watching this. Uh, this uh, Stansbury research had this uh, the gold panel with Daniela, and it had uh, uh, Juster was on it, and Friedland was on it, and uh, Pierre. Uh, what's Pierre's last name? Lassonde. Okay, yeah. So those three. It was really interesting. I encourage people to watch it. It was very interesting. But during it, they mentioned. I'm not sure if it was Friedland or Justra, but that. Uh, gold has gone up, priced in yen, 40% this year. Hmm. Isn't that surprising? Like It just shows you that that currency, it just shows you some of the things that are the, maybe under the hood, the problems that are occurring there, where gold priced in yen, it would increase that much in that period of time where it's done nothing in the dollar. Yeah. It's going to be wholesale financial chaos. And maybe... It will be made in Japan, the way everything used to be made in Japan. Now everything is made in China. So maybe it'll be China, or maybe it'll be the U.S., or or who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you saw the latest uh, uh, Peter Zihan clip where he's talking about how, you know, towing the 
the party line about how China is a disaster and it's just going to completely fall apart, but totally ignoring on, you know, the, the issues that are in the U S I don't know if you saw that clip or not. No, I, you know, as I am, as we had, a, we had a show on him. He's so histrionic and he's so certain and he's so proud of his goofy man bun and living in Boulder that tells you about all you need to know about what a whole bunch of other beliefs and values that he has. So he's entertaining. He's a great uh, presenter and entertainer, but uh, I don't think he knows anything about economics. He just, he's got a track and he runs on it and it's treating his, treating him well, I guess. I think it is. And I, this, but there's this Chinese guy who I follow on Twitter who, you know, commented on, on his, uh, on Zihan's latest on China and said, Lord, give me the confidence to speak about things I know so little about, like Peter, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. He does have a lot of confidence. He sounds convincing because he really believes, yeah, it really seems like he <laughs> believes it. If you're going to be a good promoter, you've got to be confident. People want confidence. That guy must know what he's talking about. He's really confident. He's not even hedging he's his words. That sound. Nothing got- but declarative statements. Totally, yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous. Okay, um, I'd love to. I'd, I'd love to get Zion on our show, but but it, it would work out even worse than the time we had John Perkins on the show, which was so, bad. Which, which was not. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Okay, uh, on the eve of the Greater Depression, uh, how how do you train your mind to confront whatever situation these evil people create? Like we have disaster coming. The mental game is really important, I think. You've got to recognize that these people, you put your finger on it, these are evil people. They are uh, they have bad intentions, destructive intentions. They hate you. They hate me. They hate you. They, you know, and they really want to tear down civilization as they currently see it. I mean, we're dealing with psychotics, frankly. It's like that. It's like that uh, individual that uh, was dressed up in a, uh, a Ukrainian uniform. Uh, yeah, the, the trans. Was, yeah, the trans guy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, instantly one t- one tip off that is increasingly evident when you're dealing with these horrible people is that uh, they have hyphenated last names. I mean, Bankman. Sham Sham Bankrupt Fraud did that. He used to be just Sa- Sam Bank. What was it? What was his name? Freed. Bankman Freed. Bankman Freed. Yeah, he used to be just Sam Bankman. But he had to put a hyphen and add the other name. Like, hey, I'm special. Okay, look at me. I'm a super narcissist. Uh, you know, I've got two names. And that's how distinguished yeah. I am. So they're all doing that. And the guy from the Ukraine, or girl from the Ukraine, or the creature from the Ukraine, whatever he is, or he, it it is, uh, did the same thing. So that's al- that's almost always a tip off hmm. when people do that. Anyway, what was the what was the question? The question is with what with the evil in mind that these people have. The mental game is pretty important. So how do you train your mind so that you can still so that you can deal with the situation appropriately? You've got to treat them in an appropriate way. And as far as I'm concerned, that means recognizing them and calling them out when you encounter them. But stay away from them. They're deadly. I mean, they're deadly and they're clever. And you might get fooled because it might be a criminal personality who's hiding under a social veneer and you don't see that early enough. So that's what you got to do. But, you know, don't give these people an inch. You're dealing with the enemy. Hmm. What about if you're, you know, if you imagine, if you could if, imagine the people who were in 1928 or whatever, that were living it up and just living their lives in advance of the Great Depression. Because that seems as though that's kind of the environment we're in now, where there's definitely great economic difficulty coming ahead. What about mental training or mental preparations to make sure you have the right state of mind to uh, go into it? I think that um, you've got to arm yourself with as much 
factual knowledge as you can so that when you hear something stupid or evil, you can say, eh, I don't, saying I don't like that isn't good enough. You've got to be able to spell out why you don't like it and why it's wrong and why he's romancing and fabricating facts. So I think knowledge is a very, very important uh, arrow to keep in your quiver. Okay, I see what you mean now. Because the because the idea that if you could be lulled down a, a really disastrous path as in this chaotic environment coming, if you're not able to discern appropriately, is that what you mean? Yeah, I do. Like when we get our own uh, local version of uh, Der Führer here in the U.S., uh, it would be helpful. I mean, a lot of what uh, Hitler said was, "Well, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's well, yeah," but. That's because people didn't say they they weren't in a, they didn't know enough to say yes but and go on the counterattack. So it's like that with all these demagogues. Absolutely all of them. Well, FDR, right? Same thing. F, F, FDR is the perfect example of that. Why why pick on Hitler? I mean, he's everybody's <laughs> bet noir, everybody's exactly. bugaboo. I mean, and there are people out there that have done just as much damage. Oh, we certainly get cam canceled for saying that anybody could do as much damage as, as Hitler did, that, uh, you know, get to skate. And FDR is an example of that. Hmm. Okay, that's good. All right, a question about private placements. A uh, person wants to know, what's the process of a private placement? I mean, how do you even know when a public company needs funding via private placement? Is there a website for it? Uh, number two, during the private placement, is there a possibility to negotiate with the company, or are the terms fixed? And third, how much warrant do you? How many warrants do you need uh, for the offer to be interesting? Well, these are all very good questions, but unless you're in a position to answer the question for yourself, you're only going to get stuck with really crappy private placements, like from companies that are skating on the edge of bankruptcy. And we'll give you a great looking private placement because they're so desperate for the cash. Mm. So uh, that's on the one hand. And if you're going to get into the private placement flow, uh, and there are very few of them being done these days, um, I was looking at some numbers that Marin Katusa put together uh, last month that uh, since the top of the last bull market, in uh, gold and metals and whatnot, say about 2010, 2011, uh, the number and the dollar amount and everything in private placements has fallen about 75%. Hmm. There's just not as many as there used to be right now, even though a lot of these companies are pretty desperate um, because nobody wants, the, the sector is so depressed at this point Companies don't want to sell stock. I mean, if they believe they've got something good and the public is so doesn't care about gold or mining stocks that so people don't want to sell. People are afraid to buy. So now's a great time to find a good private placement if you can, but uh, they don't grow on trees. And if you want to find them, what you have to do is go to mining conferences and talk to these companies and get to you've got you've got to wear out some shoe leather. I mean, for our file, I mean, if I find a good private placement that is open and I can get other people in and I know who it is and it's legit, I'll tell you about it. But uh, you know, for our for our file group, but I haven't found any. It's recent. tough. It's, it's really tough. tough. Yeah. So. Yeah, so if you really want to go hunting for private placements, I think you're going to have to get on a plane and go to conferences and visit a lot of booths and listen to a lot of stories. It'll be educational, but it'll be work, I think. Yeah, well, like the the Denver Gold Conference that just ended that had Friedland and Justra and uh, Pierre on the stage, that's, that's like an event you should have gone to if you're interested in looking for these deals. No question about it. And I don't know which the next... What the next one coming up is, I mean, maybe the uh, New Orleans conference that's uh, early November might be the next one on the calendar. Okay. So go to it and visit all the booths. Make friends. Yep. yep. 
It's like, you guys, it's your old adage of uh, in the room, in the deal is the key with these private placements. You got to be a known entity to people to, to get on that short list for the good deals. They fill up fast. That's, that's right. Talk to the guys in the booth. Tell them that you're, you'll entertain a deal if they come up with it and make sure that they remember you. And you so when they have it, look at the deal. But you probably won't even hear about it unless you do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how long do you think Italy has left? Hmm. Yeah, well, I've made this joke about both Italy and Canada. There's nothing wrong with either place that 50 million Nigerian migrants can't cure. And that's going to happen. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's a good question. I mean, if you're invaded, but not by people with guns, but people that you know are poor and starving, well, there they are. Are you going to feed them or, or not? And if you don't feed them, what happens? I mean, this is a, an interesting question. So the answer to the question is, I don't know, but I guess we'll find out. Exactly. We're going to find out. It's happening in real time. Yeah. All right. Uh, Doug, have you visited uh, any Balkan countries recently? He says, I'm from the EU, and, and during the uh, scamdemic, I went to Serbia to escape all the madness that was taking place in the EU. And he says, as the watermelon socialism gets worse, I see much more potential in Serbia than any other Western European country. What do you think? No firm opinion. I mean, I mean, we went to Albania together like 10 years ago or something yeah. like that. With, yeah, with maybe eight. Actually. Yep. yep. And I think it was after that, that... I went to Bulgaria because a buddy of mine, uh, that's a long story, but he's he was friends with the president of Bulgaria, and I met him, and it didn't work out well. We didn't get along at all, so I've been to Bulgaria a number of times, and Romania, mm -hmm. and where else? Greece. Um, it's part of the Balkans. But, you know, with 200 and some geographical entities in the world, you could be traveling constantly and still not be able to visit each of them every year. So do you think the Balkans have a, have a, do you think generally that that part of the world will fare better in the, in a economic collapse or a, the greater depression 2.0? You know, the Balkans is famous for uh, tribalism and people hitting each other. And it got, sounds like a bad combination. It, it does. You've got you've got uh, Orthodox Christians and you've got uh, lots of uh, followers of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, and you've got uh, Roman Catholic Christians, and they're often at each other's throats and. I don't know. It's not a stable part. Of, it never has been a stable part of the world. They've always made jokes about the Balkans, like forever. So mm -hmm. why is that going to change? Very good point. Okay. Next question. It says, I'm currently reading Drug Lord. Drug Lord is one of three novels that you've written. Um, encourage people to check those out. So he says, I'm currently reading Drug Lord. And I can see some similarities between Charles Knight, who's the main character, and the early operations of Paul LaRue. What are your opinions of Paul LaRue and his many ventures? Well, I know very, very little about him, having just heard of Paul LaRue, actually. And uh, I'm trying to guess, not knowing anything significant about him. Apparently he was, what was he, jailed for 25 years? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, serving 25 years in prison starting June 2020. <laughs> God, what a pity. So he was importing apparently propecia which is a hair loss hair loss device not a controlled substance and he was importing viagra which of course charles knight was doing um but he was re importing other things which were controlled substances now i think you ought to be able to import anything and everything and sell it to whoever wants to buy it keeps the price down People get what they want. I mean, it's very simple. Uh, abolish the FDA, and DEA, all the rest of them. But um, I don't know anything about uh, 
the character of Paul Rule, good guy, bad guy? I don't know, providing a useful service. I feel very bad that he's in jail. So, but because you had no idea, I think one of the core questions, the core of the question is you had no idea this person existed. So it certainly wasn't used as inspiration in any way for- No, 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 not inspiration in any way, no. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Question about Javier Millet. Uh, he's, apparently he's a member of the World Economic Forum. So what do you expect? Will, will he do what he's promising, kind of uh, a new libertarian hero? Or is he more like Italian uh, Prime Minister Maloney, just another puppet of the deep state? Well, it appears that, unfortunately, it does appear that Maloney, who kind of looked good for a politician, uh, it, you know, she's rolled over and she, she's no help at all. But I think Malay is a different thing. Uh, I guess the drill with the World Economic Forum is you find anybody, it looks like they're up and coming. Somebody's on their way up. That might, and they try to get them to Davos and corrupt them and size them up and so forth. So I don't know because I guess if he's elected or even if he's not, I suspect that uh, we'll get to meet um, Millet when we get back down to Argentina. But uh, I think he's completely sincere. And whether he's cor corrupted by the power that he has and uh, or not. I mean, even Thomas Jefferson was corrupted by the power that he had. So hmm. it's power corrupts. Where did Thomas Jefferson go wrong? Where did the power get to him? Well, you could argue that it was uh, in um, that halls of, of that shores of Tripoli exercise oh, yeah. with the Marine Corps against the Barbary pirates. Uh, I now, see. On one hand, I, I think that, you know, I don't like pirates. I, I think you ought to blow them out of the water and destroy their nests. And I think that's great. But uh, should should the Thomas Jefferson have come across the the ocean to do that? And it wasn't too successful in his case. It was actually it turns out to be the French and Spanish the, and British that really did the job on those Barbary pirates. But um, I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, "Hey, listen." Don't sail around that part of the world if you're worried about them, or, you know, hire some, hire First some guys to fend, fend them off. But why should the U.S. taxpayers pay for you, you know, sailing around someplace that, you know, you... right? So this whole this whole thing about uh, using the U.S. military to uh, back commercial interests apparently goes way back to Jefferson. It does. It does. He ought to be ashamed of himself for. Uh, we're having doing something that's immortalized in the Marine Corps. Him, him. Wow. I mean, it's not the government's business. I mean, mm -hmm. go across the world because some businessman gets his tit caught in a ringer. We have to bail him out and get no war. No, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I, I recently read a, a a biography of Smedley Butler, and that man was in about you know everything that happened during you know between. 1898 and thereafter every conflict and that he, he's the one who came to the conclusion later that it war is a racket basically that he was the hired thugs to defend um commercial interests that's what he was doing in the marine corps yeah 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 exactly what a mess okay uh let's see next question is uh what is life after the nation state look like as a result of financial collapse followed by commercial collapse and finally political collapse well, how gloomy do you want to get? I mean, <laughs> Let's go all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything's possible. I mean, the Dark Ages uh, were were nasty. Uh, the first Dark Ages, starting at around the year 1200, and the second Dark Ages, starting at uh, around the year 400, more or less. Uh, both of them lasted a long time. Civilization collapsed. So... And this time, maybe it'll be more serious because we're so dependent on all kinds of technologies that we don't know how they work. And so I don't know. It's hmm. I'm pretty I'm pretty gloomy, but don't let it get you down. Okay. It's yeah. gonna be yeah. It's like free entertainment. It's free because yeah, you're paying for it, but 
you don't actually have to buy an admission ticket. You can, you know. Free admission. Free admission kind of. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Is, is it true that after um, coming out of the dark ages that people in Britain would see, would come across the these remnants of the Roman Empire, like aqueducts and roads and things like that, and that they assumed that giants must have built it because they couldn't fathom how the technology to build these things. Is that true? I heard that once. I don't know. Yes, it is. It is. It is true. Uh, that's what they were saying at that time. And the same thing happened during the first dark age, starting in around the year 1200, the end of the Bronze Age. Same thing where uh, you know people saw these giant stones and giant buildings and couldn't figure out how anybody could figure out to do it. So it must have been gods. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. The, the ancient ones, you know, the before times. The before yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> That's how far it can fall. We're literally, you know, your your grandchildren have no idea that how something could even exist that they see in the world and imagine that giants or gods must have been involved. That's crazy. Yeah. And and except for the ones that are taking STEM courses in college and are diligent and learning to learning things and doing things. The average person's, I think he's just clueless about all that. I mean, look, at least when I was a kid, a lot of the guys knew how to repair cars and we liked cars. We used to play with them and we knew how to set the points and clean the plugs and, and maybe take apart at least the upper half of the engine. But I don't think anybody can do that today. No, no. Uh, can, this is the, the dominance of a consumer culture. Con, consumer culture in a service economy where nobody really knows how to do anything. No, we all know how to watch things on our on our computers Good or devices. Our phones. And, and uh, well, I'm like I said, I'm I, I'm pessimistic, but uh, you know, human nature is unlikely to change anytime soon. So we'll make a comeback and. Thing, good things that are lost will, will be rediscovered again. There was a renaissance. So. Right. And along the way, you know, the collapse of the Roman Empire, there were still pockets of, you know, Roman civilization, right, that continued or, you know, or people, it just, you yeah. just lost the the binding tie of, and all the technology and commerce that came along with it, right? Yeah. And, and you got to look at the bright side, too. It's that uh, the Roman Empire towards the end was so corrupt and dysfunctional that Romans were escaping uh, the bailiwick of the empire into barbarian lands so that they didn't have to be bothered with uh, the parasites that the empire set on them. That sounds familiar. Um, it's true. That, I mean, there's a lot of testimony from uh, Romans that were, were bailing out because uh, it was <clears throat> better to go into barbarian areas than and stay uh, in Rome where things were falling apart and there were these horrible people that were, you know, eating them out of house and home. Yeah. Same mm -hmm. thing is happening now today. Okay. All right. Last question for you, Doug. Uh, he says, Doug, with America becoming a full police state and the world not much better, what areas of Africa would you suggest to an American veteran in his 30s with a VA pension of 1900 a month? who has low living standards, where should they go? And also he says he's done security for VIPs in the past with a provable resume. Would that get him employed or get him targeted? Well, that is a good question. Uh, start with, it's that in Africa, um, this is not anymore like it was after World War II or up until the 60s when uh, the average African, there were very, very few Africans that had any education and the military were, you know, just a bunch of thugs dragging their rifles around by the barrels. And, you know, and, you know, you should watch, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Dark of the Sun. Those were the days, I mean, if you were in the Congo in those days, you, you know, there was real opportunity. But now, uh, you know, these African armies, thanks to the U.S. going in there and training them and giving all these great skills and great weapons to them that 
which are incidentally used to uh, suppress the the people. That's what those armies are there for. They're, and occasionally, you know, attack the country next door, you know, if the, if the ruler thinks he can get away with it. So the U.S. is in the back of a lot of problems. But answer the question is that um, you'll find that it's not the happy hunting ground that it was years ago. Uh, I think all you can do is go there and look around for opportunities. Just, you know, what country do you want to go to? What would be a good place for you to start? I think the shallowest end of the pool. I mean, the nicest country that I can think of in Africa, just arbitrarily picking one out of the 54 now, I think um, Namibia hmm. might be a good place to start. And, uh, you know, you want to go into the deep end of the pool, you can go to where all the current action is up in uh, the Sahel area. And which, which is now, uh, now called, maybe it has been for a while, but I saw today, it's, they call it the coup belt. The coup belt, yeah. But the whole continent is the coup belt. This is going to be really entertaining, uh, watching what happens uh, yeah. in the future, because Africa doesn't produce anything except for raw materials. And if the uh, world economy collapses, as it should, uh, raw materials are going to be harder to come by. And, you know, you've got to mine them and stuff like that. Uh, so... You know, Africa has just been a giant welfare. The whole continent's been a welfare state forever, where you know, NGOs and governments throw money at it. Most of it goes back to Switzerland, of course. Of course. But, uh, but uh, no, I, I listen. Africa is going to be really fun to watch. It, it really is. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to show up in Namibia and just ask questions, see who you can meet, and just kind of scope it out to see if there's a place for you. Yeah, I think so. I would I would start in I'd start in Namibia and I'd go over to Zimbabwe and up to Zambia. Then I'd go up to the southern Congo, which is a really very different from the northern Congo and the eastern Congo. And you know, move from there. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of last time I went there. And where did I go before that? I went to the Cameroon for a week. And all these countries are really, uh, they're all different and they're all interesting and they're they're all weird and they're all fun. And uh, you just got to bounce around and meet a lot of people and hope you got the skills that somebody's going to want to buy. Yeah. And you get that, you get that, uh, if you have that military pension, you can, you can finance yourself moving around a fair amount with that. You don't have to worry yeah. about working. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you might find someplace over there there's a million widgets that are for sale for a dollar and you might be able to figure out how to sell them someplace else for two dollars yeah okay all right good doug well thanks very much i think we'll wrap it up for here and uh, we'll be back next week have a good weekend hey thanks matt have a good one